Alrighty. Okay, so I think the last time we chatted, we, looking at this, I think, Miguel, this was you actually, where we refactored this update function a little bit. And we were just saying, um, oh yeah, because our new update function now with this new runtime called browser.element needed the subscriptions thing, right? And the update function looked a bit different to the previous one. It now returned not just a model, but now it returns a model with a command of my messages as well, right? So we had to refactor some stuff. Um, and did we get to see what those were for? I don't think we did, actually. We never saw the outcome other than we just got it working again. Our same old app works the same where we can minus and plus and we can reset. But nothing new magical really happened here. Oh, yeah, one of the cool things I, I thought about afterwards is like when we refactored this, remember, here's our original update function, which like feels quite crappy, actually. So if we clean it up a little bit, it's like, OK, for increment, we create this new model thing, which is the model where we've changed the value to the original model's value plus one. And then we return new model. And we always return in command dot none, right? And we saw that there was this repeating pattern happening here for each of these things. So, and so that's where I think Miguel, you jumped in and said, well, couldn't we neaten that up? And I think we did. So we made it look like that, which is probably a better refactoring of it. So it's like now we say, well, update two. I don't think we ever actually updated this thing there. It shouldn't really matter because I think it will do the same thing. Is where we said, oh, okay, so we can create a new like value or variable. Um, I'm going to use the word variable, but know that it's not variable, it's a value. Um, uh, new model equals, and then we, 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 we like sort of update the model over here. And because we're always returning command at none, we can just do it in one place, which is down there. So it's kind of like we've, you know, we've refactored it. So it's like there's less um, boilerplate or copy paste going on here. But interestingly, um, one thing to realize here is really like the, so when we think about the, the way these languages work is they resolve that they use something called reductive, um, that the order that stuff executes is through reduction. I think we talked about that. So it's not through like the lines, the way the lines are written in your program, like you would be used to in an imperative style. So it's not like new model runs first and then this runs next or something like that. That's what you would expect in like a in an imperative style. But really what happens is this line actually is the only line that runs for this function update. And what it does is it, it is it goes and reduces things into it. So it, it when it looks at this line, it says, oh, okay, your update two function is this returning a tuple with a thing called new model and a thing called command.none. And then it goes, well, what is new model and then it looks up and it goes oh a new model is this thing and then so it almost like it reduces that thing into into there so it's all it's actually identical to going to taking these like number of lines and literally pasting them there it's like actually the same thing does that make sense so i could actually write it like that too does that make sense so this variable yeah it's not really a variable. It's just like it's it's the name of a block of code, if that makes sense. And so this doesn't look great. So it's like, oh, I don't want that there. So I could just call that new model and paste that block of code up here. But that, does that seem weird to anyone or are you comfortable with that idea? Isn't that the same as named functions with open close bracket? That when you call the function, it's actually calling the block of code. Yes, but so the difference would be say that we had an Im imperative language and we said x equals five and then y equals 10 and then f of x plus y or something like that, right? If these were three lines in a function, this would happen first, this would happen next, and then that would happen next, right? So whereas in, in this language, in a functional language, what it really is looking at is it looks at right at the end. It says, what are you doing right at the end? Oh, you're doing f x plus y. What is x? Then it looks up and it finds 
six and it goes oh x is five so it replaces five there and then it goes oh what is y like oh you're using this thing called y let me go and look up the line above and go oh there's y y equals 10 okay put 10 in there and then execute that function does that make sense so it really only executes the single expression of that function the function only is a single expression where things can be um where you can create these like ideas of value because you say, well, if X plus 10 doesn't make sense. So if I had a Z equals 20 here, um, as an example, so press caps lock, um, and I had F X plus Y, we would never have, because Z is not referenced here at all, it would never be evaluated. Does that make sense? So it's the same way that I wrote if, if I go here and I create some new things in this, so now we're back in Elm, I go x equals 10, like 500, or z equals x multiplied by a million, or something like that. These things are never evaluated because they're not used in this function. Do you know what I mean? They're just placeholders. Of, they're, they're just values that can be grabbed in order to reduce the function, reduce the. Um, uh, expression of the function. Does that make sense? Yeah, would it be right so to think of it? The way. It, it? like you know, like a clever imperative compiler will take. Oh, you never use this. I'll, I'll throw it away. In in this language, that is the default. It's like this thing is never evaluated. So even if I had z equals console dot log hello dogs, and I obviously can't do this, but in an imperative language, you would expect console dot log to be executed. Do you know what I mean? Because it would be like, do the first thing, do the second thing, do the third thing, do the fourth thing, right? In this language, Z is never used, so Z would never be evaluated. So yeah, the, I was gonna say, so it would be like thinking uh, pretty much, it's like syntactic sugar for ease of readability, oh, as okay. well as tree shaking built straight into the compiler itself. So it statically analyzes, uh, uh, analyzes the coding goes okay well you're never using this so i'm going to just shake this out like we don't need this it, in fact it's not even the it's not like a it's not that it, it, it's doing that in addition it's like it is the way that evaluation happens evaluation only evaluates the one thing and in order to evaluate it it needs to reduce these things so, so it says it, like it doesn't know what new model is so it looks up fetches new model and literally pastes it in place right there you know what I mean? So it like literally, so it's like a, um, I don't know what you call it, like it almost expands the expression beneath it um, until everything is expanded and then it will evaluate it. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's just, a, it's, it's not like a big deal, but it's just something to get used to. Um, that That is the way you think about this. So this, this code here, is like absolutely equivalent to taking this piece here and pasting it in there that's because that's exactly what the compiler is going to do it's just literally this thing new model up here is just the name for this block of code that makes sense so if you just pasted it in there they're completely equivalent so that's one way of like of it's almost a way of when it comes to refactoring um, code, when you start to see common patterns like this, like these all look the same, except for this little part here is a bit different. You can almost say, well, can't we just give a name to this thing and give a name to that thing? And then you can just paste that name in there. So is my network giving you guys issues? Are you able to hear me OK? Yeah. Okay. Mostly, it is a little bit tinny and choppy sometimes, but we hear you. Okay, just just shout at me if you miss something, because I just popped up a warning saying my network is not great. Okay, anyway, we'll 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 find bit more examples of of that down the line anyway. But yeah, I think we'd like our update two function, so let's keep it. And um, right, Tom, before you move on, can I quickly ask? Yes, go ahead. and we don't have to deep yeah. dive into this whole thing, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. I kind of see a difference between the word abstraction and the word refactoring. So does the syntactic sugar um, end at refactoring and doesn't cross over to abstraction? 
no, or am I, I don't. thinking about that completely different or incorrect? No, no, I think that that's a very interesting point. It is a bit correct, but um, yes, refactoring, but also abstraction. Quite right. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that that this is also one of the key ways of creating abstraction is through this mechanism. It's probably similar. It's like charts when Chant was talking about a currying and partial application of functions. That's probably yeah. like the primary way of abstracting things is with data types and with functions. That those are the primary tools. I mean, there are no other tools to create abstraction. That's all we have. Right? So <laughs> that's what you have. Yeah. So when you when you try and abstract things away, you do it either by applying like partially applying functions, creating the fact that something is captured into a function means that it's abstracted and the you know the next person who calls that function doesn't care about what was already applied to it they just apply the yes. next thing or the last yes thing. yes so but our let thing our let thing is not a new function is it it's just a label on top of something else yeah yeah exactly but it can be a function it can be a function so we could say that um, we had a function here called add and add takes like an X, oh, why has it done that? Takes an X and a Y and it goes X plus Y. That That is a new function. Okay, yes, that I've okay, okay. Yeah. you can do this. And then when you use yeah. that, you need to provide X and Y. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, exactly. So we, we could even say like, so we could even, I mean, we're getting into uh, a little That's bit said, more detail, but, but deep, deep dive into it, but um, yeah. I mean. No, but it, it's very cool though. So like, for example, like if you look down here, you could say, actually, you know what? These three lines are looking pretty similar still, right? This, this model with plus one and this one model with minus one and this one model will equal zero. Could we further abstract these away so that we don't have this re repeated thing here? And it's like, yeah, I think we could, because we could say, well, let's make a function called uh, model. Or that's probably a bad name. Let's just call it like make, make or something. And what it does is it takes the new value V and maybe it takes the model, sorry, and the new value V. And what does it do? It takes the model and it sets the value equal to V, right? And now we could just go like make, make model value plus one or something. Sorry, this would be model dot value plus one, right? So it's like, yes, I can make a function to that kind of, I don't know if that helps anyone, but this would be make model minus one, and this one would be value, this one would just be equal to zero, right? Make model zero. This one is make model, whatever it was, minus one. And then interestingly, you could say, well, this kind of sucks. Like, don't we just want to make even this is like we're repeating model dot value here in here. Don't can't we just apply the function here plus one to this thing? And so we could. So we could say actually this is an f of v function f of v, and it's f of v with v in sorry with oh, with model with m. Yeah. And now you could say, well, I want to apply plus one. And I don't know if I can do this with Elm. How do I apply plus one in Elm? Can I? Mm, well, no, I also thought it was brackets, but I see it's not. Can we not do that? Could be that that's too too awesome. <laughs> um, plus, plus is a function, right? So what is plus one? Plus one, not a function. Plus one. Oh, it is a function. Plus one and two. Yeah. So I could go plus. I think I should be able to do this. Plus one. Uh, yeah. Think... Oh, yes. Okay. I think I've, I think I've fixed it. Yeah. Minus one. And this one is just zero. So it's like there. I've abstracted it even further by creating a function which does that stuff for me. Right. And I, yeah, I think that works. Um, it seems to be an error. Now, oh, up the old update function. 
And then now, yeah, why yeah. don't you par partially apply the make model so that it's just going to be whatever new function yeah. plus one? Totally. Exactly. You see, you're getting it. 100%. And then you can say, hey, make model is like very common here. We're always doing a make model. Yeah? So like we can then re abstract that out, you know, and I'm just doing it with functions just by making functions. So you're quite right. So we could say we could make a make model, which is equal to make space model, right? And then we go make model. Bonk. We haven't made it less code, but um, we made it. So we just call it M. Or we call it model is. Model is. Look at that. We're like getting it down to nothing. We're reducing it to like, I mean, probably insanity now, yes. Probably insanity. Because right? I don't know if this has made it more awesome or less awesome. But effectively, I mean, do you guys understand this? So make is a new function which takes two things, a model, and some function to apply to that model, right? So f of v, actually, interestingly, because over here we're going, we take, we execute f v with m. So it, the compiler really knows that this thing must be a function that takes something that seems to have a value inside it and it returns a b. So it's like, sort of like our model. It's kind of the compiler's actually gone and said, yeah, it could be our model, but it could also be something that just got a value because all you're doing with it is you're saying value equals. So you so it kind of knows that f of v gets executed with a thing m, and m is definitely some kind of object which has a value. That's all it knows. The compiler just deduced that just from this line. And so it said, well, f of v must be a function that is a something which is like a like a um, an object or like a record. And that record definitely has a field called value in it. But it could have anything else. It, it could be a record with any other fields in it. As long as it's got a value and that value thing is of type V, of type B, sorry, this function FV must return also that type because we're obviously setting it here. We can't change the type of, of V, of value. Value must remain the same type. Um, which, which pretty interesting, actually. It's pretty, pretty cool, actually. So what is M? M is like it's any old record that has a value of type B. So it's like, okay, awesome. And, there's our, and then we're saying, okay, so we made that fancy function. Then uh, Damien partially applied model to make. So we've already set M to whatever the model is. And we've made a function called model is that all it needs is that FV thing. So it's not it takes something of type B and returns a B. In our case, we know that the model is an int. Value is an int in our scenario. And so as long as we provide something that's a function that takes an int and returns an int, we can pass it to model is. So plus one is a function that takes an int and returns an int. Minus one is a function that takes an int, returns an int. So interestingly, what is zero? Is that a function that takes an int and returns an int? It isn't actually, is it? Hmm. I would imagine this should say const zero, but I don't know if you can do that. So that's because there's zero in it. We had zero and we give it one. I don't know how that works. I don't know why that's not a compile error. Oh, maybe we do have compile errors. Update two. Oh, sorry. I just called it update. Let's see if that's in error now. Oh. The argument is number to a number, but model is needs the first argument to be. Yeah, doesn't plus need both oh, arguments? Well. Yeah, but we can partially apply the first or the second. Oh, we can partially apply the first argument. Oh, so plus one is its first argument. So that would be one plus, actually. So that's probably fine for plus. But it's not fine. So the idea is right, but. So the execution is wrong. Um, needs the first argument to actually be the model producing an int. Yes, quite right. Um, so why is this? Oh, so actually our function should take m dot value. That was our bug there. So f v takes a b and returns a b. Perfect. Better. Oh, okay. So now my zero is the. 
is the issue. Yeah. And this is still an issue. I think the minus one is wrong, right? Because you can't just, this would be saying like one minus. This is the first argument to minus, which is one minus whatever value was, not value minus one. Do you know what I mean? So this is still wrong. We'd have to say is a function which takes an int or a, or a value or something, and it would be value minus one, right? That would be, they're not equivalent. Do you agree? The, the, the original one, when you just take, if you say minus one like that, I was gonna make this a, a comment, but minus one actually means it's a function that takes a V and it'll take one minus that V because this is the first argument to minus. You know what I mean? Yes, you agree? So one minus V is very different to V minus one. It, but for plus, it doesn't matter. If it's one plus 10 or 10 plus one, they're the same. Like plus doesn't have the ordering issue. It doesn't matter what you add together. It doesn't matter which order you add things, but it does matter in the way you subtract things, right? Um, anyway, that's more more accurate. So the way to fix this one is who wants to take a guess at how do we make something equal naught? It's the function that doesn't care and always returns zero. Yes, exactly. So to take a V, just always give me naught. So in fact, I could always take an underscore or something, right? And they should. There should be a function called const. That's what I was looking for. Uh, Elm reference. Is there a function called const? Elm packages. Is this useful? Ugh, const. No. OK, but I mean, if you think about it, you could make a function called. So in Haskell, there's a function called const, which is like const is a function that takes x and always so uh, if you say const of x it's like it's a function that takes anything so it's like um const of x with anything so like x and y always returns y right that's what const looks like so i mean about this? no it just wants to type in the question so we can say const is a function that takes anything and in anything and always returns us the second thing, right? So we could just go and say, and so in fact, you never need to name X, so you can just name that underscore, and we could just say const, yeah, yeah, const zero, do you know what I mean? That means a function, you can give me anything and I'll just give you zero, doesn't matter what you give me. Does that make sense? It reads quite well, so it's like the model is constantly zero, yeah, you know. But const is a nice name. It's a nice function. Uh, there's another function called, in that same like way of thinking, there's a function called identity, which is give me anything and I'll give you back that thing, right? That's the identity function. So he's also a handy one, but he's a function that when you give him something, he will always return that thing to you. And there probably is um, for identity, I would imagine. Anyway, this is, it's a cool, it's a cool one to know about. Okay, so we have. It's worse, yes. I think we've made it decidedly worse. Do you guys agree? Well done, Pavesh. All right. Thing. I did say let's not deep dive, but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So internet is, uh, internet's a bit trouble. crappy oh, oh, now. Is it, is it crappy? Catch up with you guys later. Sorry. Yeah, you break up quite a lot now. Any better? Oh, is it? I'm on crappy Wi-Fi, unfortunately. There's not much I can do about it. Is it usable or not usable? Yeah, it's okay-ish. I don't know if you could switch up a video or something. Maybe I should turn off my incoming video. That might help. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I thought what we should do, um, it's just, yeah, we'll leave constantly, is we never looked at these subscriptions, right? So I'm hoping that there's a nice simple subscriptions for us to play with. Now, maybe time is a good one. So here's commands and subscriptions. We can obviously do interesting things with subscriptions. I like go and fetch stuff, HTTP then. Or we could do JSON parsing. We can get random numbers. Random could be interesting. 
Um, should we do random? Yeah, let's do random. Why not? Um, random or time. These are, these are good, good, simple subscriptions without needing too much. So let's see how random works, first of all. Okay, so it goes random.generate. So let's see if we look in subscriptions. Where's the entity thing? Okay, browser.element, and they go subscriptions equals subscriptions. Okay, so we should expect a function called subscription somewhere. There it is. So it takes a model and it returns a sub. That's a new thing, sub of type message. Okay. Um, takes a model and they're saying sub.none. Oh, okay, so that's not an interesting description. The new thing here is command issued in the update function. Okay, so let's see where did random get used. Roll. Takes a model. Oh, so this is returning a command called generate. Then what is type new face? So new face is one of our messages. Ah, okay. So this is okay. So let's let's try this random thing so maybe what we can do is we will add a button we've got the cool minus and plus and reset and we've got that thing which says miguel to us but let's add a new button which is when we go on click we're going to do some like random what should we call it set random right and we're going to go text random or something i can't spell is my sound any better chant yeah, we can follow you. Okay, so this is obviously has a has a compile issue because it doesn't know. Re remembering that our view has to return an HTML of type my messages. So anything that it generates down here has to be of this type my messages. So it's saying, hey, you know what? Set random is. I can't find the set random in your. Oof. It's actually not that clear, but really it's trying to say set random is not one of these types, my messages. So we need to just go back to my messages and say, actually it is, it's going to create it. So we're going to create a new message type called set random. Um, okay, now our next compile issue is like, okay, but now on your update function, what happens when you get a set random? What do you want me to do with the model? So we need to handle it, set random takes like and so what do we do now we can just I suppose mess around and we say well that's a const 100 for now right so if you click the set random button you're going to get a we have a oh sorry i'm not actually running the thing build it yep so now if we click random do we get 100 no we don't why not does it work set random What's our issue here, Alex? No mind. Nothing works. Uh oh. We've created a bug. Let's not do a little bit of it. It's open. So, doesn't the is model or mm, the make oh, model, okay. sorry? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, does it not need you to define that you pass in in a function, uh, like a variable? But no, okay, never mind. From the way you explained the evaluation, it probably doesn't because it would just replace everything. Yes, I hear you. you, do you I can see the bug there. Can, can you guys see the bug? So look at the behavior. If I click, it's almost like reset and random do work. But what they're doing is they're keeping the model value the same. So is there not a problem with that const function here? Just look at it quickly. We're ignoring the x value that we're sending in. Correct. So should we be doing that maybe? Is that better? It's like it's the first value that you want it to always be, which is that one, the first one, right? So remembering that this function gets applied to model at some point, or model.value, I should say, up there. And what we were doing is we were keeping the second one, we were returning y, which was like, oh, keep it the same as what it is, right? Rather than 
returning the one that's parameterized as the first parameter. We want the first parameter one, right? So reset to zero, random to 10. Does that make sense? Anyway, uh, cool bug, right? Um, uh, anyway, fixed. Okay, so we've got, all right, cool. So set random goes const 100, that's fine, but what does it act, what should it actually do? Um, it looked like there was a function called random.generate. Okay, so what do we want to do here? And uh, maybe what we can do, like this is probably a good way to, instead of like coding it all like into that little gap there, often I would make like a new thing here, like R. R equals random.generate. And uh, let's see what, what we get. Okay, so it looks like it doesn't know what that is. We probably have to import it somehow. Can my IDE do it? No. Where did we get random from? Okay, here we go. Import random. Oh, we probably have to install it as a package. It's an Elm package install. Is it? Uh, I don't know what the, the syntax is. How do we install a package? Elm install, I think. Elm install. Random, I'm guessing. Oh, Elm slash random. Yes. Yes, please. Okay, successful. Um, and then mm -hmm. we can start again, I suppose. Okay, it's happy again. Yeah. Okay, random is good. And so now R is five. So R is equal to random.generate. Oh, it would be so nice if it told us what that was. Anyway, okay. So how do I find what he looks like? Why can't I hover over this? Can I hover over that? Oh, everything's broken. Yeah, everything's oh, broken yeah. now. Oh, you know what? Could be my language server needs a restart. Yay, fix it. Restart language. Okay, so what does generate do? Okay, so this is handy. You always just want to look at the, in fact, what does the function, what its signature looks like. Okay, so this is a bit complicated, but let's see what it does. So its first its first thing is like something that takes an A and returns a message or a message. The next piece that takes a generator of A, so a generator of that part, and the function itself will result in a command of that message. So this is quite interesting, and I wonder what generator first of all let's just see how they use it um oh they okay so this is the first thing that they they take and then random dot int and then between these two things okay so i suppose the question is what the hell is that so we should take one and make one of those uh, s equals random dot int and let's see what random dot int looks like ah cool okay so random.int takes an int and an int and gives us back a generator of int. Okay, so that's handy because we remember we needed a generator.int, a generator of type A, which generator of int will be fine. So that's the second parameter to generate is this generator thing, which we can do through random.int. And I think it's probably obvious that the first one is like the lower bound and the second one is the upper bound. Whether it is inclusive or exclusive is unknown except we can see a square bracket there. So that means what? Come on, you are to the university long. Inclusive. Exclusive? Exclusive, right. Or is it inclusive? No, it's inclusive. The round brackets are exclusive in math. Is it exclusive? Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, good. So there we go. Uh, now we know, so this will generate an int between one and six, including one and six, right? So we can call this G maybe, that's probably a better name. So it's a generator of ints between one and six. Awesome, and we know we can give, we don't know what the first parameter to this thing is, but we know that the second parameter will be the single G. So we could just say here like, and here's an interesting way of doing this, is you could just say, well, the first parameter is like this funny thing called C maybe, and we could say C equals, um, I think we can. Oh, uh, yeah, we want to create a hole. Mm. This might be too complicated. I don't know if I can create holes in Elm. Can I? No. Okay, so we need something. And 
let's see what type it, it needs to be. Sorry, this is a, a rabbit hole, which is not going to work in Elm, unfortunately. The first parameter is something of type A, and we know that A will be what type? In our situation, what is A? An what type is A? It's an int. Yes, good, because we know that generator of A will be an int. So the compiler is looking for something which is an int to a message, right? And it's like, well, what is the type of message? We look over here, you get a clue. Come on. It's something which is like, the, what does update do again? Look at it, it's type. It returns a command of my messages, right? So what does, so when we talk about this generate returning a command of lowercase message, probably what type is that in this context? My messages, right? So that message is there. It's probably the same as my messages. So it's like something that takes an int and returns a my messages. Make sense? No? So we could go and look at my messages. What are my messages again? It's like, it's this weird type, right? It's this type with all of our like, all of our messages that can come through the update function. So can we make, so so we could make a function which which does that exact thing, which is like of type int to my messages. Let's make that function. We'll call it like, the who knows function takes is of type int to my messages. And so what does who's and who knows do? It takes an X and it returns something of type my messages, right? And it's like, oh, okay, set random. And it's like, well, any of these useful? It's like, no, none of these. So I could, I could say it returns a reset or something. Like there's a function. So we could say, so who knows is now a function which takes an int and returns a my messages, a specific type called reset. So we could now go and say, so R is a, so R, so now we can call it random.generate. Now we've populated all the things and we've got R. And it's like, what type is R? Uh, sorry, it will be of that type, right? It's a command of my messages. So it's like, okay, that's awesome. Um, so how do I use him? We know that this function needs to return a command of my messages. We're always returning command.none in all situations. So we could now, I suppose, return him there, R, and that would be okay. It's like a bit weird. I don't know what's going to happen. Let's see what this thing does. Um, so now if I press random, it could go into some infinite loop, which is yeah. absolutely possible because now we're generating a million. It's like literally when we press that button, every time we handle an event, we are causing a command reset to happen. You know, that's what we're saying here. But causing command reset to happen. So like we probably don't want that because that's just going to put us into an infinite loop, right? We're just going to get reset, 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 reset. Because every time reset comes through, it does this, and then it returns R again, which is reset again, reset again, reset again. Uh, so that's like we're doing this wrong, right? So here's the solution. Here's the solution. What we want is we want to go. Uh, I don't know how to call this. Like we could say. Trigger random is the button, and then set random would be something that takes an int. Set random with an int. So we want a different type of my message that we can handle here. So instead of who knows returning reset, we actually want to return set random there. So it's like because set random is already a function which takes an int and is of type my message. Like let's look at what type set random is. Yeah, it doesn't tell us nicely, but if you think about it, set random is actually a function that takes an int, and when it does, it constructs a thing of type my messages, right? So it is a function from its type is int to my. I agree with that. Set random. So set random. That it's called a constructor. That constructor takes an int, right? And it is, when you give it an int, it gives you back in my messages. Do you agree with you? Do you agree with me? So his his type, set random, is something which takes an int and gives you in my messages, actually. Happy or not happy with that? 
the bit out there, a little bit out there. So you can the function that when I give it an end, he gives me my messages because he is a constructor of this type, right? A little bit funky, but bear with it, bear with it. So set random is, is that thing. So, so let's just get this to the point where it actually probably does what we want. We can like filter that a little bit and say, you know what, this G thing is like very cool, but actually we don't need to make him a variable because it's quite obvious what he does. So it's like, so R is, okay, we'll leave it there called R. So this is like, this is effectively a, a command of type set random. So it's like do the set random thing, right? Is what we can call this. We don't want to return it every time though. Like we only want to return that when someone clicks the set random button. You agree? Yeah. So now we've got this bit of this funny thing going on here, which is, um, oh, sorry, when he clicks the trigger random thingy. So when set random gets called, it's going to pass us the new random value. And we're going to set that into our model. When trigger random gets called, we want to keep the model the same. Model is, I don't know. And we can keep the model the same const model dot value, but we also want to when we trigger it, we want to return a different command dot none there. One that says, hey, when trigger random gets clicked, we want another update function to we want a generated integer to happen and then set random to be called in our update function, which will then which will then be passed this new random value, which will then get set into the model. So it's like because we only have one update function and one must generate events and the other one must receive events like update can do both update can create events but it's also handling events right and so whatever we return here is us creating events into into the elm runtime and we're always saying command dot none which is saying no events no events so we, we need to change that right? we, generally we do we, we want no events but sometimes like when we when we click trigger random we want to cause an event which is to go and generate a random number so we need to refactor this, unfortunately. Um, and we probably want to go back to our previously unrefactored version, or can we think of a better way to do this? Um, uh, we could maybe if you, I think yeah. I might know of a way. Uh, if we move the case statement yeah. into the thing, and then uh, on each resolution of the each case, instead of returning model is, we return model is comma a tuple of model is with the whatever it is and command dot whatever yeah. yes 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 yeah i'm happy with that i think that's the right approach so we're going to go like for increment the model is that and command dot none right yeah is that what you're saying so we yeah, want to return yeah. that. that entire case statement it's not not a let thing it's just the main function Keep typing command dot bob. I don't know why that is, but um, we're going to do this, 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 and we want an open bracket here. And I'm sure we could probably find a better way to refactor this thing. And we're saying there's no more let. Uh, in fact, there's no more new model. Like we're going to do that, and we're going to go in there. So we, we still have a let. Oh, sorry, I should back pick that. Like that, right? Change the command and trigger and random. On. Yeah, now the command. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah. So we want to, on this one, we want to go do the random thing, do the set random thing. I don't know if that's <laughs> really for me. But yeah. So. Probably. Okay. What bugs have we got here? Oh, yeah. So we don't call set random anymore. We call trigger random, right? That must trigger random and set random. Okay, so let's just see that it works, and then we can oh, blast this too. Oh, because I infinite looped it. Uh, let's go big. We go random, 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 random. Yay! Look, we get random numbers happening between one and six. Inclusive. Well done. The mathematicians were correct with the random thing. Okay, so who wants to explain this? <laughs> How this is working? Yeah, I'll take a stab at it. 
go for it. Yeah, so clicking the button, if you think of that Elm little circle, you know, that that little graph of how the Elm runtime works. Um, so clicking the button, yeah, causes a command or a message. So it's the front end message. OK, yeah. and that is to trigger random. Message yeah, that's the that yeah. trigger random. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then yeah. the new front end is actually rendered. But then we're saying once that random Which generator is, is done with his job, yeah, once the random generator has a new number ready for us, call the or, or send another message to the Elm runtime. And that message is um, set random and the value of the random. And then it goes through that loop again. So Elm will receive another or it will run the update function again with that set random message and the actual random value. And then the, the front end is actually updated again with the random yeah. value. Perfect. Exactly. So in fact, this is probably overly the fact is probably stupid. So trigger random. In fact, we should just do that really. Right. Make yeah. it like obvious. And you can also change the front end um, to say a loading random number because that's actually a state of the front end that you don't see. Mm. Um, but maybe it was cool to. I don't know if it, it will probably be too quick. Um, but you can imagine there's a state with the front ends in where it will be yes. generating the number. Could we yes, see that exactly. by the number so, of events that are generated by the runtime, like in that debugger thing? Well, let's actually check it. Yeah, it's a very good point. Yeah. So let's go plus plus random and let's see what yeah. has happened. Two events. So we saw increment, yeah. increment, trigger random, set random. Yes. So we can see that there's four. So every time we click random, in fact, we generate two updates. Yeah. True. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you random, can you can probably see random. that better when you do something like an H. This leads nicely into an HTTP call, which works the same yeah, way, exactly. right? Then you say make this call, yeah. and when you come back, issue this message. Correct. So we could let's go and do your idea that we can like keep some sort of loading state, right? So we could just create a new field in our model called state, and we could say that's a string, right? Um, and let's just add this, and let's just follow compiler errors here. So at this point, we've added a state called string, I mean, a string called state, and we can see there's an error up here, and it's saying, yeah, but in your init, you are like not setting it, basically, is what it's saying. Something is off with the body of the init, body of the tuple is of type. So you're returning a thing with a name and a value of the type. On init says it should be a model with. So what it's almost saying is like you're returning thing, something that doesn't look like a model. You're returning a thing which has got a value and a name, but that's not the same as model because model has a state. So uh, that could have been a, a better error message, but it's not too bad. So let's go with well, state equals init or something, right? That's our initial state. Compile errors are all gone. That's good. Nothing here should really change other than our time travel debugger, which has now disappeared. There it is. And now if I click something, I should now have the state being passed. I can now see state in it. And if I plus minus and random, probably always set to in it, right? Because I'm not doing anything with it. It always just hangs around as in it um, with that value. So now we can say, well, actually, when we trigger random, we do want to change. Oh, yeah, we, we're not changing the value of the model. That's what that thing is doing. Effectively, what I could, in fact, this is like, I don't need to call model is, I could just say model, right? Like don't change the model, just return the old model. But now we know that we want to set, change the, the value of state to something. So how would I do that? I'll take the model and I would say the state of that thing is now equal to triggered or something. So there's our new model with the state equal to triggered. And then when I get the set random, so it should be like that. Trying to keep the, uh, we, we, we want to do this. We want to set it to a new random value, but we also want to set the state to something. So I can't do that with my cool model is function just yet because he's a bit too basic. All he does is allow you to change the value. So I'm just going to be naughty and say, well, I want the model. 
to be the same, but I want the value equal to the new random value, but I also want the state to be set to um, done or something, right? Does that make sense? So there we go. Uh, and we never get to see state on our display either. So maybe we should put it here, possibly text model.state. We could combine them there. It's now going to say Miguel in it, yeah, which is a bit weird. So this is creating like two text things inside the same div, which is weird, but not that weird. Um, so I could just go text uh, like this or something and separate them with an arrow. So it's Miguel in it. I click random, goes to done. But there was a little millisecond where it was, I don't know where the debugger keeps disappearing. Okay. But there would have been a tiny little millisecond and we, when we went trigger random, the state was set to triggered for a instant, and then set random came and it was set back to none, um, which is awesome, but it's like pretty non non visual, but probably because the random number generator happens almost instantly. Um, okay, happy with that? Yeah. I wonder if so you change another... it from a random number from one to Nine 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 nine. If it will take longer, <laughs> probably not. I wonder how many, how big an int can be. Oh, some can handle some big ints. Uh, that's cool. Random. <laughs> so nice. <laughs> so it's like got big integer, big integer support <laughs> built in there. Oh, okay. So there's some <laughs> something nasty happens when ints get too big. Um, he's, he's okay there. I don't know. It's definitely not going to take longer, right? I mean, random number generation shouldn't really matter how big the int is, because um, it like happens at like probably at the byte, you know, at the byte level. Um, doesn't really matter. But another, I mean, just to I know we've got very little time, but another interesting one could be because uh, we haven't used subscriptions yet, actually. So what we did in this example is. We returned, we returned a command of my messages saying, "Hey, like we're returning something to um, out of the update function. It, like we always we're handling something which we triggered earlier from the update function. So the question for me is still, like, what are subscriptions? And subscriptions are. Let's look at them. Um, I think time is a good example of a subscription. So if I want the time." I can't just ask for the time. I can't just say, hey, give me the time. And then I get the time because that's a function that would be non-deterministic, right? If I had a function called get time and, and I ran it twice, and it, right? I'm sure that there is a way to get the time and it is probably through call to my update function, no doubt, where it can be passed the time based on some kind of interval. I, I, I could probably say to Elm, hey, I would like you to call update um, every second, and when you call it, please pass me the current time. Do you know what I mean? And that way, the time, my update function, which I can then probably store in the model if I wanted to. So let's see how that works, and my guess is that would happen as a subscription because it's not something that would be initiated as part of the update. It's just like I want it always. I always want to be given the time. It's not based on any other event happening. It's not based on someone clicking a button or based on, I mean, maybe the subscription is based on clicking a button, but I'm not going to click a button every time I want the time. I just want the time all the time, right? It's not based on some event that I'm going to generate. And so, I can already see sort of how this works. So let's just quickly, let's just look at their example. And I can kind of see they're doing this. Uh, um, oh, this is a just time zone. Oh, that's interesting. Time dot here, task dot perform, a just time zone, time dot here. I don't know what that means, but what is time dot here? What is time actually? So time is an imported thing. Task is an imported thing. And that was in subscriptions, no. No, that wasn't in subscriptions. Here are subscriptions. Ah, oh, okay. I think we. This is probably some advanced stuff around knowing what the time zone is. 
Um, let's just start with this easy one. So subscriptions, we know, takes a model, and this and it must return a sub of type message, right? And they're using something called time.every. And it's like, oh, this looks familiar. This is almost like what I was saying. It's like, hey, every 1,000 milliseconds, please call me with something. So let's go and have a look at time.every. So I think it was import time. Oh, I can't spell import time. Is that just built in? No, it isn't. I've got to import it. Helm install helm slash time. Now I'm guessing. No, should I move it to yes? Good. Okay. So we took a guess and that worked. Yay, time is sorted. So now we can see that it uses this on subscription. So let's just go and hack it straight in there. Here's our subscriptions method. Oh, there he is. Okay, so currently we're returning sub.none and we know we want to return time.every. So let's just do this in the, in the cool way that we used before. We're going to go let in the r equals time.every and we look at time.every. So every takes a float and then a something POSIX to a message. And it, is, it itself must be of type sub of message. So we know our function. So this is a bit weird because subscriptions right now, we haven't been specific about what type of message it uses here. But if we had to go and say int there, I think this would cause us a compiler error and somewhere. And it would, oh right, it would come down here and it says, so I'm just populating the type. Yeah, I'm saying actually it's an int. And down here it's going to tell us subscriptions can't be of type int. It needs to be of type my messages. So that's like there's only one of this previously said type message. The only choice that makes sense to the compiler is that type, my messages. The same is true of this model here. It's like it can only be of the type model that we're using. At the moment, we're leaving it off. Um, and the compiler is inferring that type model, but we couldn't infer, we couldn't tell it that it was some other type. It will tell us quite clearly, like, no, it cannot be an int, it must be a model. So it's like, okay, it's obviously a model, can't be of any other type. But we can go lowercase and say, ah, you figure it out, compiler. That's what that's saying, because we leave it out as a type variable, the compiler will figure it out. But most of the time, it's like better to say, actually, we know the type, it's of this type, it's model. Um, same with sub, that's what I did there. So time.every now, we know that message is of type my messages. So time.every takes a float, so we can give it a float, 1000 makes sense. And the second parameter is something, which given a POSIX must give us back one of those my messages. And remember if we took, we had a little trick earlier where we could say, yeah, we can make one of those functions. We can call it set time and set time must take a POSIX because we know that it must take a POSIX. It's a function which takes a POSIX and returns a my message. So set time could be one of those. It's a constructor which takes a POSIX and it is of type my messages. Put the type here. Takes a POSIX and gives me a thing of type my messages. Okay, so we don't know what a POSIX is. These seem, names seem right, so it's like we have to import POSIX maybe. I think it's just time. time dot right, I think that's right. Yeah, time dot is quite right. Cool. Um, so that was a little bit of trickery, right? Um, and now we've got other errors, which is like, oh, okay, you're not handling. You can read it, but probably it's you're not handling the case. You're missing the one where you handle set time. It's like, okay, let's make it set time, and then we take the time or something. And we can start with the basic thing, which is like do nothing, just return the model and no command, get rid of our compile errors. Do we have any more compile issues? No, I think we're good now. Yeah. Okay. But we're not probably doing anything. I doubt we're doing anything. Let's work again. Minus plus, yeah. Uh, we're not actually using this thing. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So now we can time dot every, we can put our set time function up there. So now R is is a sub of type my message. So we don't need the sub dot none thing anymore. We can now just return that subscription, right? Yeah. After that. I don't know why I'm getting these. 
I'm gonna try to restart my language server. Try again, Elm. There you go, all fixed. Uh, so, interestingly, so do we see this happening at all? So let's have a look at our debugger quickly. Look at this. It's like, oh, check. That is, our update function is being called every second with some big number. So set time is now being called with some big number. So that looks like it's working. Do you agree? And I suppose what we can do now is like, hopefully there's a way I can convert this easily to something readable. It is very hard for humans to read a POSIX time though. So we use functions like two hour and two minutes to view them. I love it. It's not the best. Um, that's not that useful. Uh, is there a way to print the time better? Time equals new time. And on every, how do they view their time? Uh, hour, minute, second, and then hour, minute, second. Okay. Time dot, I'm not going to do this. Time dot two second, model dot zone, model dot time. Ugh. Does it suck? It does suck. So can I just print? Can I just print it somewhere? Okay, let's go here. Oh, we should probably store this thing. So the model needs to like keep, because we're not updating the model, right? And we can't just display something that's not inside the model. The only thing that can be displayed is stuff that's inside the model, right? So we have to add something to our model, like the time or something. I don't know what we want to call it. And we say, yeah, this is of time, time.posix, that's great. And then we get a big area here saying, well, what is the beginning of it? Now, this is an interesting question. It's like, well, how do we, what do we set this to? Can we set it to naught? Is that okay? Probably not. It's probably going to say, yeah, like you're returning a thing which has a number, but you said you would return something which was a POSIX. And in fact, naught is it, not a POSIX. So that, that it is not, might be how not you good. name the property in that case. I think you used an underscore. Uh, you mean in the model? Yeah, in the model itself. Yeah, time underscore the. Not time capital the. Oh, oh sorry, not uh, the oh, capital the time. time. Oh, good, cool. good catch. I still do expect that to not be okay though, because it's like it's saying that has a number in it because we I put it as naught, so the compiler says. And that's a number. Um, but in it says it wants a model. So it's clearly saying that thing up there is not a model. I suppose I could have been specific up here. I could make this a more specific error by saying, oh, your model is of type model, dude. The compiler, like, dude, model is a model. And now this thing would say something is off. It's saying the body of a record is of type that with a number, but the type annotation says it should be a model. Oh, and it says only int and float values work as numbers. So it's like, it would have been nice if it had said naught is not a time dot POSIX, but um, uh, I suppose we can go and find out. How do I find time dot POSIX? Is that, how do I find this shit? Time popular your helm slash time. Ah, there we go. POSIX time examples. Good. Good. Okay, we saw this. String dot from in two hour UTC. Oh, UTC. Okay, so that's handy. Two minute takes a UTC. What does it give us though? Uh, how do I set the zero one? What is what is zero? Future plans. Okay, that's good. Uh, time. New. New. Every. Time zones. Oh, there we go. So millis to POSIX will take an int and give us a POSIX. So that's quite handy. So I could say milli, oh, I can't copy it. Milli, so the time dot millis to POSIX zero. So that will give us a time at zero, right? So if you yeah. did time dot now, wouldn't that give you a POSIX of the current time? But can we get the current time? Is I think the there is that go? time dot now. Or that now, isn't Not that would that be time dot now? This gives us a task of x of POSIX. So it's like 
it can give us a okay. it gives us like some task. It can't give us the time, right? We know that there's no function out there that could give us the time right now. Because if there was a function like that, that would be an impure function. We know that, right? So, but however, you can have a function that when that could return something that when it's executed or something could give you the time. That's okay. And that's what this task thing is. I don't think I want to get into the detail of task just yet. Um, but, but they can't really be a function like that. What are you saying? Type POSIX equals POSIX space int. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I see that. So that's no, we a could just do. Yeah, we could just do POSIX yeah. zero. It, yeah, it, look, it looks like it. I'm wondering if you can though. So let's try it. Time dot. So we're going to call that constructor directly, right? Time dot POSIX. Um, and let's see if we can actually call it. So if we go in there, type POSIX, computer. I wish I could see the source code for this thingy. But it looks to me like it is not a, con it doesn't have a constructor. I don't think. I do think that this would be a hidden, it's like it's a constructor that, yes, can create a thing, but not for you to use. It's like a it's like a private constructor. So it's like it's a type, but we don't know what the actual constructor. And because remember, it's like saying it's of this type. It's like of type my messages, but you can't just create a my messages. You have to call one of its constructors. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So th there's no ability for me to create a like x equals my messages of five. There's no such thing. You know. My messages is the type. So X can be of type my messages, but I can't just somehow execute that type. I have to call one of its constructors. You know what I mean? Okay. You'll probably be fine. And so that's the difference. Like POSIX is a, a type. It's not actually a constructor. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, but yeah, you're quite right. You, you, I mean, it's a, it's a good thought. It is a good thought um, to go look for that, but no, we have to call one of his functions to create that, to like construct that type, you know what I mean? So time dot minis uh, of zero. I know we're out of time, but let's quickly just finish off this guy. Um, so that's our init, brilliant. Set time comes in and we want to go and say, oh yes, when we get called with set time, we want the model, but when the time was, I called it something funky. You remember Miguel, oh, the time equals the time, check out my amazing consistency there. The time equals the time, brilliant. Um, so now we've got a model, at least keeping it. Um, and now it probably makes sense to display that somehow. I think my errors are probably gone, but I'm sure set time is being called. Amazing, brilliant. And now we've got a model holding it, which is super cool, but that's not really being displayed anywhere. Um, so let's use their awesome two, was it two minute or from they had some cool example of how to do this? We have UTC, which is a handy is, is of type zone, that's handy. Uh, string dot from int two second. Let's just do that, right? So we're gonna call that on some new div. We'll say text. And we're gonna call string dot two int. Let's just fix this. It's gonna be like time dot two second and Time dot UTC and and this would be our model time. So this will be model dot the time. Something like that, right? Yeah. So those things passed string of, I don't even know what these things are. I just I just um, sort of qualified them. And so hopefully now we're seeing the second ticking on our view. That's pretty cool. And we've asked for it to only update us every second. That probably makes sense if we are interested in seconds, but we could ask for the time more often. It's actually one every hundred millis every hundred milliseconds, so many times, and then we'll see it like more accurately update, right? Uh, so we get lots of events, but they will we you know, so we, we should see different time precisions coming through our model there because we're only interested in seconds. Okay. It's a bit stupid, but um happy with that. I think it's not bad. Thousand again it probably makes more sense. Yeah. Okay, so we know what subscriptions are. Subscriptions are like a way to get our update function to be called with stuff 
uh, more regularly. Like if I want the time, that's a good thing to subscribe to the time because I can't, I don't have a function where I can say dot time or time dot now because we know that's not pure. So subscriptions are for things like that um, where I want data coming into my into my program that's not necessarily generated by me. You know, what I, mean? I didn't cause that that event. Uh, I wasn't the originator of that event. Like time ticking is something that's not caused by me. Uh, and, and there's other things, like potentially I have a WebSocket connected to a server, right? And that server writes something to that WebSocket. That would probably be a subscription because like, I didn't, I initiated the connection of the WebSocket, yes, but um, he just wrote to it, you know? Um, and so that would be a subscription. Um, uh, and, and, and there are other, there are other, there are other examples of subscriptions, potentially things um, where, potentially, so I have this LMAP and this LMAP is embedded inside a larger web application, right? Because remember this, this, this whole app that we've written here has managed to shove itself just inside that little element, right? Div.id, but I could have, you know, on the outside here, and, and here's, so, I mean, here's my app application compiled Elm to JavaScript is inside that index.js, which we know if we look inside it, it's like, oh, in here runs the Elm application. And we pass it, so it goes get element by ID main, we pass it the node main, right? So like we, our app renders inside there, but anything I render up around this thing, like div hello from regular uh, HTML, right? will just kind of render around, you know, around our app, right? And anything beneath it, of course, as well. So I could have other things going on in my. I might have some React app or whatever. There could be other ways that I want to get stuff in from app into my Elm app. And those could be through subscriptions as well. Like someone maybe maybe click something in the React part of my application and the React app wants to tell the LMAP, hey, how's it? Something happened, right? Um, that would be probably via subscription as well. So it's some sort of external event that I didn't necessarily trigger, if that makes sense. So you, you could expect to see subscriptions in, in other places, not just time, if that makes sense. Okay. Any questions from anyone? I think the only thing I'm curious on the subscriptions method seems like it only allows you to return one subscription. Ah, so yes. That's a very what would be the question. case is, if you would need to listen to multiple things? That is an amazing question. Very well done. So there is this magical thing called sub dot. And remember, we were going sub dot none earlier. So it's like sub dot none. That's not one of our types. That's not of type my messages. So. Keep in mind, we're not returning a my messages. We're returning a thing which is of type my message, which is like specialized or templated on my messages. And so sub is actually a bit of a special collection, um, meaning that probably we could put a couple of different things that return my messages into here. So sub.none being one. Let's look at its type. Sub.none is of type sub of message. Brilliant. What other? Other stuff do we have here? So we've got sub dot batch. That's an interesting one. What does sub dot batch do? Sub dot batch takes a list of sub of message and returns a sub of message. Does that make sense? Okay, so in the case you'd send back a batch of things you want to listen to, and only one of those subscriptions would ever trigger, or they could multiple trigger, but there would be different events. Yes, but the way to read this is not to say it will be one of the it's all of them. They're just combined into a single. So remember, they must all be of the same type. There must be many subscriptions, but they're all of the same type. And that can be collected together as a sub of type message. Um, that makes it's like, well, let's look at it. So this is how you would use it. You would say sub.batch, there's the first one. And then let me just format this. Otherwise, it's going to kill us. We could also say, we could do it again, for example. So it's like, actually, hey, hey, sub.batch, I want a time.every1000 set time, but I also want a 
time of every 30,000 set time. So I could have as many subscriptions in batch. As long as they all of type sub by messages, it can combine them into a single one of those. And the same is true of Thanks. command down here. So the same is true down here. So where we go when update returns a command of my messages, and often we go command.none, I think we can expect to see that we could go command dot batch, batch of these things. So we could we, we could return many commands through command dot batch. So command dot batch takes a list of things of type command dot message, and it will return not one of them, but one type of command which has got all of them inside it. Okay, you know what I mean. So it, and I, I know that that probably looks weird because it looks like it's choosing one of them out of that list. But it's not. It's like it's like if I've got a list of lists, I can return a single list with all the elements of all of the sublists, right? Like the like the, okay. the you, you know what I mean? Like the type flatten, for example. Like if I've got a list of one and two and three, and I combine this with another list of uh, sorry, I should go four and five and six. I can produce a list with all of them: one and two and three and four and five and six. And it's only one list, but it's got all the elements of the, the lowercase one. So it's, it's not like it's returned one or the other. It actually has merged them, you know, in some sense. You know what I mean? So that type sub, is like you could imagine it's like it's an aggregate. Okay. Um, command dot one, command, uh, sorry, sub dot none think, being the empty type. I think then a good example in the subscription method, if we go back to that one, instead of doing the two uh, set times is potentially maybe saying uh, set random and you can pass like set random six. It's like every second yeah. it will actually reset it back to six or. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. yeah, except the problem is with set time is it wants to be given a POSIX, but yes, you're quite right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, so what means could... is like you've got the set time one and then the other one would be set time. So you'd have set time and set random, the two subscriptions. So the every would, in my head, at least from how it's been explained, the every would trigger every yes. second, but it would trigger a set time and a set random. Yes, except the problem is going to be that it won't. So don't you just need an set enter random, the set random? It needs it to take. Set random does take an int. Set random takes an int. Set time takes a POSIX. And okay, so time would... dot every. No. Okay, so it would have to be the same my message. It couldn't be a my message. No, no, of it could be a different set. one, and and we can make it. We we can make it do that. So we can we can make a set random that takes a time and call and creates a set random of int. Right? We know how to do that because we've got this cool thing down here. Um, what what we should probably do is is rather the trigger random. I think rather than the set random, like we could go trigger random. Yeah. yeah, and it's saying, okay, yeah, but the second argument of area is not what I want. I want it, it needs to take a POSIX right. and give me back a message. Your thing just takes the message. So we could just say const there, which is like, well, throw away anything you give me and just generate a trigger in. Yeah. But the effect being like every second, hopefully, we should get I a think you still have that random. random. Oh, yes, quite right. Yeah. Like, right. But every second call trigger random, every second call set time. Yeah, there we go. So now every second it's going to, because this function doesn't matter what we give, but it's going to give us a trigger random. So it's almost throwing away the POSIX parameter. Right. And there you go. Okay. So, so yeah, that was what I wanted to oh. check if it could be different types of my message. And yeah, so you'd use like a const, yeah, like so you said there. Yeah. Okay. Please come up with <laughs> I was thinking I the same it. thing. I'll commit it right now. Get status. There we go. Get add minus a. Or dash. Yes. <laughs> Done. It's yours. Oh, these are passphrases. Oh, sorry, guys. Don't watch my hands.
Okay, that's in. Any other questions? <laughs> Quite mind boggling, even for this like simple thing, but actually it's worth trying to understand this because like we're we gonna build on top of this. I think we can, you know, it takes a lot of getting used to, that's for sure. It's okay that it feels uncomfortable. It is okay. You're totally allowed to feel uncomfortable. Yeah, this should feel uncomfortable. Um, but you should also start to go like, oh, look, type matching. It's like, it's really just about matching types, you know, like, and, and when you see lowercase and uppercase, what the compiler is going to do, like lowercase things, the compiler is always going to try and find a concrete one if it needs to. It's going to try and match it with a concrete type. So there's the difference between like uh, type variables, which are these lowercase ones, and actual types. So actual types can be parameters to type variables. You know what I mean? You know, like lowercase things need to be. So it's it can be confusing though because in Elm a lot of the you know when you look at the documentation and stuff, you're going to see type variables everywhere. These are variables. And because it's like they're writing a function that will work with any type of message. You know what I mean? And has to, like every, the function every has to work with any type of message because it's up to me. It's my app, my type of messages, my messages. But like Bavesh is going to write an app and his type of message is of type Bavesh message. You know what I mean? So it's almost telling you that the every function here doesn't care what that type is. It doesn't know about it. It doesn't need it. So it keeps it as a variable. It's like, no, it's up to the, the compiler will figure it out later when Bavesh writes the code. It will go and populate that concrete type if it needs to. But that can be very confusing when you, when you first get into here. Whereas float, yeah, not a variable. That is a concrete type. It's definitely a float. There's no disputing its type because it's got the uppercase F. We know this is a float. It can't be any of any other type. And this is a POSIX. That POSIX, this function needs to take a POSIX and return a type of any type of message as long as it matches that type. This message must match that message. These are the same types. Whatever type gets concreted in there must be the same type as that one that gets concreted over there. And that's what the compiler is using to infer. That's its type inference engine. It's like resolving types and just making, if everything matches at the end, you're good. It means you haven't broken the, the type system. Very powerful, very powerful. But it takes a bit of getting used to. Okay, dudes. I wish you the nicest Thursday afternoon. Thanks for the session, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, awesome. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Cheers, guys. Bye. Cheers.